Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were very close, and she came to the United States to support him. She came on Face the Nation, and I said to her, but he lied to you. Doesn't that hurt your friendship? Oh, no, she said. Our friendship is rock solid. And stupid me, I asked essentially the same question a third time. And she snapped. She snapped. (laughs) And she said the following, which is the worst thing that's ever been said to me on live television. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Leslie Stahl, I am so excited to talk to you. Thank you for joining us today. You are a giant in the media world. I have to thank Esther Newberg, our mutual friend, for arranging this. But I know you're also interested in neurodegenerative diseases because of your late husband's passing uh, due to complications with Parkinson's. I'm sorry for your loss. We're thrilled to connect with you and look forward to hearing your story. Thank you, Tim. I'm thrilled to be here. Even if we didn't have the Esther connection and you called me, I would have said yes immediately. And in fact, I think I did. Uh, It's not connected to Esther, whom I love and I've known my whole life, I think. But uh, just because I'm, as you know, interested uh, in neurodegenerative, degenerative diseases. Um, I'm dedicated to helping find a cure for Parkinson's and now it'll be ALS as well. All right. Let's start back at the beginning. Your mother was tough. Do you have any siblings? What are some of your favorite memories as a kid? Um, Well, before I tell you about the kid part and the tough mother part, uh, my (laughs) brother, Jeffrey, had larynx cancer And when he first had his voice box removed, he had no voice at all. And he used to hold a little wand up to his throat, and he sounded very mechanical. Um, A little bit like what you sound now. You sound better than he did. But he got something called the Blumsinger valve. He was one of the first people to get it. And if he held his finger on his throat, he had his voice his actual voice. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. Um, And you're reminding me of him a little bit. So that's my brother. I mean, he died when he was 55 from his larynx cancer. Um, He has two children who I'm also devoted to. Uh, My mother was tough in the sense that she wanted me to have a career. She always said to me, no job. It has to be a career, and I don't care what it is, but it has to be something that you you will find and hold on to for the rest of your life. She was my puppeteer. She pushed me in my career. She uh, directed me. She picked out my clothes (laughs) till I was 35. It's embarrassing. Um, And she first told me not to have children. And then when I did turn 35, she wrote me an incredible letter saying, I made a mistake. I was wrong. You should have a child. And she said, um, my boyfriend was Aaron at the time, who we talked about. He had Parkinson's eventually. But she said, he has wonderful genes. You should have a child with him. This is my mother. (laughs) So I did. (laughs) I had a child with Aaron. We got married. And uh, she just 
she actually was the director of my life till I had a child and I became the director of my child's life. So anyway, that was my mother. She really did push me in my career. What do you think made her uh, decide, you know, change her mind on having a kid? She wrote me an incredible letter. Um, it was annotated. She'd done research. Uh, the first thing <laughs> was, what do you think you're on this earth for anyway? And she said, the reason <laughs> is to procreate. So, you know, you have to fulfill your destiny. She said, um, if you don't have a child, you'll also think of yourself for the rest of your life as a child. Mm -hmm. And if you want to become a leader, um, you can't be a child. So you have to become a mother. Um, and uh, she never said, it's because I want to be a grandmother, but I know that was in there, so I know it was implied. <laughs> and to read between the lines for that one. Yeah, and you know something, uh, both Troy and Tim, um, she, if she told me to have a child at that point in my life um, without the letter, I probably would have had a child because I, I ended up doing whatever she told me to do. It's embarrassing. <laughs> they did. It worked out. It worked out. It were everything she told me worked out. I hate saying that. It's like killing me to say it, but um, <laughs> she was right. Did you have any aspirations as a kid? Did you ever dream about being in front of the camera? Never. Um, in fact, my search for a career under the direction of my mother. Um, started out with architecture, moved to medicine. I did some pre-med in graduate school and hated it, just hated it. And so um, that that clearly was not the path. And then I was kind of flailing and went to work uh, on the speech writing staff of the mayor of New York, John Lindsay at the time, and wandered into the press room, and it was the first time the whole idea of journalism even entered my mind. I didn't work for the college newspaper or high school. We had one. Um, I, I guess I, I, I wasn't. It wasn't presented to me in any form. Um, so it came as a surprise when I asked a reporter, "What do you do all day?" And he told me what he did, and I said, oh, my, that's me. You know, that's what I have to do. It was a click like that, just a moment, a snap, uh, a, a recognition of instant clarity, I guess. And um, that was it. it when took you had a that moment, time. did, you, yeah, did you call your mom and tell, <laughs> talk to her about it since she was? No. No? But I told her that I wanted to be a reporter and that I was going to pursue it. Um, I knew, I knew it was what she told me I should do with my life. I knew it. And it took me a long time to get there because uh, I basically had to, I was not that young and I had to start at the young person's place, which was the bottom of the ladder um, and climb up fairly slowly but the truth is I loved every step so it, it worked for me and every step seemed like I'd arrived so I first was a researcher and I thought oh this is heaven you know I'm going to be a researcher and fine and that then I was a producer again this is the place I'm meant to be and it just kept moving for up I, without really ambition in a way it wasn't I have to be a reporter I have to go on camera none of that it was just kept happening I read that your father's father was called boss where did that nickname come from and what did he do um, first of all he was one of my favorite people in my whole life my grandfather um, he came to this country around 1900 he had been a lumberjack in Poland and uh, 
where he he came and lived where his older brother lived, which was in Peabody, Massachusetts. And there were a lot of there were a lot of tanneries in Peabody. So he went to work in a tannery Um, and they discovered that he had a gift. Um, He could discern very subtle differences in in colors. So if they made a batch of color, they had three colors in those days. They had brown, they had black, and they had something called oxblood. And if they made several batches of, let's say, black, he could tell that batch A black was not exactly the same as batch B, and he knew how to make them the same. So he be, he was a colorist. He eventually became a colorist in the tannery and decided that he would start his own company, a color, a leather coloring company. They called it Finish, Leather Finish. He started Stall Finish and was the boss because he started it um, and brought his two sons into the business and grew the business and he, he was the originator, so they called him boss. And he was very sweet. He was not a boss boss. <laughs> what did your dad do? I've read he was a philanthropist. Oh, well, my dad worked for his dad. And the truth is my dad was a little afraid of his father. And if, if anybody had to tell, if anybody in my, my father, let's say, had to tell my grandfather something, that my grandfather might not appreciate. He used to send me in to do it. <laughs> grandpa. <laughs> I didn't call him boss. I called him grandpa. Um, I was his first grandchild, so I could tell him anything. And uh, my father worked for him, uh, ending up running the company um, and developing the company. And it was successful. It became an international company which my dad sold in 1964 to a big conglomerate. And my dad went to work for the conglomerate. And uh, they started a new division, which included my dad's company. And my father told me he was never happier than when he worked for that company. He He loved it. It was a great job. He had to grow his division. So he went around the world buying companies for his division. He was a happy man. I'm going to have to take the strategy of sending my my daughter in to my dad whenever I've got bad news. (laughs) He doesn't say say no to anything, Leslie. They ask me, they're like, can we have ice cream? I'm like, guys, we're going to eat dinner. And and my daughter's uh, five right now. She's like, can we have ice cream? And I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So they all, I'm like, guys, no, no, we're eating dinner in an hour. And then I'll hear her go <laughs> to my dad. And she'll go, my, my son is not so good at whispering. He'll go, let's ask Pop. And they go <laughs> in the other room. They ask my dad. And my dad goes, yes, of course. I'm like, dad, come on. You know, so, so it's a good move. It's a good strategy. So, Troy, I wrote a book on being a grandmother. It's called Becoming Grandma. And one of the things I discovered is that when you become a grandparent, and your father will tell you this is the truth, there's some actual biological change that happens in the brain of grandparents. And what that creates or accomplishes is that our ability to say no is disabled. (laughs) So he can't help himself. Yes, I can it's the tell. only word that is possible <laughs> with grandchildren. <laughs> I've never heard him say anything other than yes. Yeah. We used to have this really funny thing, and we can move on. We used to have this really funny thing. My uh, my daughter used to be, you know, my, she was learning like animal sounds. My wife was like, "What's a cow say? Moo. What's a dog say? Bark. What's pop say? Yes, that's what she used to say." <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so Tim, we have that in common. <laughs> Troy, I was the one who had to say no when you guys were growing up. With the grandkids, I get to be the fun one. Leslie, your mother's recommendation changing about having kids is interesting. What do you think made her change her mind? Um, she told me that my beside the fact that in order to become, um, she used the word leader, 
I had to have a child. But she also said that uh, my life would be fulfilled. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not sure that her arguments, intellectual arguments, made a difference. It was just that she told me what to do, and I always did what she told me. But it turned out to be um, the most important secret of happiness to me. And I love my career. You know I love my career. I'm 82 years old, and I'm still doing it. So you know I love it um, and loved every minute of it. But it's nothing compared to how much I love my daughter. And now I'm a grandma. I'm going to cry. I'm now a grandmother. Uh, and these things are the biggest. And I know, Tim, you would say the same thing. I know it. You don't even have to say it. I know it. Uh, we have that society of grandparents. My dad explained to me when I was talking about having kids, he said, it's like the, the movie The Grinch. Like your heart grows three sizes. Oh, wow. It's like, you learn you like you think you you think you know what love is and then when you have kids then you actually understand what love is Ex oh wow well put well put i, I wish i had come up with it yeah i <laughs> wish i had before i wrote my book. <laughs> anyway it's true um i'm i get overwhelmed by my the kindness of my daughter to me and how when Aunt, my husband got uh sick um when Parkinson's really, really grabbed hold of him, which happened when he got COVID, um, how she became my partner in helping him navigate the difficulty that he confronted then. One thing that happens with Parkinson's that does not happen with ALS is dementia. And so we, we had that. That's tough. Yeah, it's tough. So, not not that uh, you know you want uh, ALS is tough too, but in a completely different way. So that's yeah my point. Yeah, they're all they're all connected. The the I think from a medical standpoint, they're going to find out that they're all connected to what's causing them and to cure them. But also the the relationships like. When I, if we talk to somebody, you, you know, you, you don't know, haven't experienced ALS directly. I haven't experienced Parkinson's directly, but I, I know, I know what it's like for you. You know what it's like for me. My dad knew what it's like for your husband, but your husband knew what it's like for my dad. You know, that it's just that connection there. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, especially with the, the kids becoming close too. I think my family really, we were always close, but when my dad got sick, we really got even right. closer. Everybody kind of rallied together. Exactly. Um, Tim, right now I'm in Los Angeles where my daughter lives. And I'll do any story in Los Angeles, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is, you're, you, you would never ask me about this, so I'm going to volunteer this. Just, and yeah. it's in the side and it's off track. But um, I, when Aaron first got Parkinson's, or w when it was first diagnosed, he heard about boxing as something that was uh, that helped with the symptoms of Parkinson's stiffness, balance, things like that. So he boxed and I did a story on it for CBS Sunday morning and boxing spread all over the country for Parkinson's because that Sunday morning has that kind of influence. So a friend of mine called me and said that his wife got Parkinson's. And she boxed, but now she's doing something else. And I said, what? And he said, I'm glad you're all sitting down because you're going to fall over. Part <laughs> Rock climbing. Rock oh climbing. My God. Oh, my God. So I am in the throes of doing a story on rock climbing for Parkinson's. That's what I'm working on. And as part of it... Uh, my my daughter and her husband are rock climbers, uh, just coincidentally, actually. And so the, I went rock climbing today for the first time <laughs> with, with a camera. Um, 
that a friend took pictures of me doing, not CBS. And I said, if it, if I don't look like a complete idiot and I don't make a fool of myself, I'll give CBS the footage. <laughs> and if I look terrible, then I won't give them the footage. So we've decided I'll give them the footage. I did it. I actually went rock climbing today. That's awesome. So it, what awesome. Is it? it slows it slows down the symptoms or just keeps you active or what is it? It it actually uh they're not sure what the mechanism is. It doesn't obviously slow the progress of the actual disease, but it helps mm. with the symptoms. And one theory is that the elation that they get from climbing the wall in a gym or actual uh, cliff, which I've seen them do outside, gives them such a, a boost of happiness that their brain fills with serotonin and dopamine, which are mm. the chemicals that help people with Parkinson's. That's really Parkinson's is a dopamine def deficit. So your brain is flooded with it because, you know, the sense of, I did it. I accomplished this impossible feat, which it is impossible, believe me. Um, so that's a theory. And it does help with the symptoms of Parkinson's. That's the last, probably the last thing I would have guessed if you'd said there's another thing. Exactly. Exactly. It's astonishing. You first met our friend Esther at Wheaton College. What was your first impression of her? Any listener interested in hearing more about Esther should tune into episode 19. <laughs> well, Esther Newberg um, is a phenomenon. Uh, everything she ever set her mind to, she not only accomplished, but excelled at. So she is the best literary agent ever. Um, she worked in politics before that, and she was wildly successful. Um, and in college, she was a star. She was a, she she hasn't changed. She has that. She had the saucy tongue. She had the humor, um, <laughs> and she had the brains. Really, um, I liked her instantly, and I still like her. We're really close old friends, and uh, I treasure that really. I know people think she's tough. You talk about tough, my mother and all that. Maybe I'm attracted to her because she's a little like my mother. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I, I know the squishy, soft inside. Maybe you do, too. So I just think she's the, the greatest. In college, you studied history and graduated with honors. What were you planning to do with that? Maybe teach? And what did you do for those eight years after you graduated? Um. I don't know how old you are, Tim, but when I went to college, at least for women, for women, you know, career was not in the mind. For most of us, uh, marriage, you know, you got married, you finished college and you got married. There aren't many role models for women my age because there weren't many women who were succeeding in careers at that point. Um, Esther and I graduated in 1963. The women's movement was just beginning. Uh, the women's movement of that era, because there had been women's movements before that in history, but uh, it was just beginning. And uh, the only person talking to me about career was my mother. And she was pushing me because she was unhappy uh, in the suburbs she should have had a career, and she didn't. So she was pushing me in that direction. But um, when I was majoring in history, the idea of a liberal arts education, the idea of expanding your mind, we used to have required courses for the first two years so that you could be well-rounded, studied history, art, English, everything, science, um, so that you could you could get a taste of all the disciplines 
just so that you could be a well-rounded person. So in those days, you we didn't go to college because we necessarily uh, were sort of getting ready for a career. Even people who went to medical school and knew they were going to medical school, for example, um, didn't necessarily major in biology. So when I got to college, by that point, I knew that I was going to be a doctor (laughs) and um, didn't major in biology. So after college, I had to go to postgraduate school to get take biology and chemistry and those kinds of courses in order to go to medical school. So that's what I did after college. And as I told you, I hated it. So I, I had to change direction, and I didn't know what direction I was interested in by that point. Uh, it had been architecture, then it was medicine, and medicine stayed all through college, even though I majored in history. I majored in history because I liked it. You know, I took history courses my first two years because they were required. And then I chose my major based on what I was interested in. You've said that life began for you at 30. How did it happen? You're obviously beautiful and smart, but did you have any training? Um, I said that my life began on my 30th birthday um, which is true and what I meant was I had found what I was supposed to do in life and that was to be a journalist and on my 30th birthday I got my first real job because I had been preparing up until then I got my first real job as a journalist on my, around my 30th birthday, and it felt wonderful. Um, I knew I was on, on the right track, and it felt I was, I was settling. I was settling and starting my life, and I was right. I, I, I said it that day, and I remember I'm, I've never been athletic, um, but I went outside on my 30th birthday. I was living in Boston, and I ran up and down the Charles River. And I just ran up and down, up and down, being happy. Take us to 1972 when you were working in Boston for a CBS affiliate. Did you just get a call out of the blue, or did you put a tape together and send it out? And what was that moment like? Um, I didn't. No, I didn't get a call. I tried to get a job at the network. So I was working at a local station um, in Boston, and I wanted to go to CBS, or I didn't really care which network. I just wanted to move up to that level. And I um, – actually, I did get a call. You're absolutely right, but but the, the I, I had to apply – I had to be interviewed. I, I had to sell myself in order to make that jump. And finally, uh, the, the bureau chief of CBS News in Washington called me, you're right, and he said, um, if you can be here tomorrow, you have the job. And I said, well, sir, you know, I have an apartment in Boston. I have to... I have to sell it. I owned it. And I have to find a place to live in Washington, and I have to move. And he said, look, if you don't want the job, just tell me. If you want it, you'll be here tomorrow. (laughs) I was. I just went. I went. I have no idea how I – I don't remember how I sold my apartment in Boston. I don't remember that. I just went. And uh, I wanted the job so badly. But that's what happened. He was tough, that guy. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a leap of faith too to move your whole life on one day's notice. Oh, there that. was no question. If CBS News hired me, I would do anything. I um, mean, that was uh, that was my ambition to to move from that local station and go to to one of the networks. As I said, I didn't care which one. 
but they're the ones that offered me the job. Please tell us your Watergate story. Also, you coincidentally moved into the Watergate complex, right? I did. I did. It was it was funny, I guess. Uh, I was living in a, an apartment at the Watergate complex. Um, I was the newest hire at the CBS Washington Bureau. They hired me because of affirmative action. They were looking for women, and um, uh, my timing was impeccable. There I was. I just showed up when they were looking for women. And um, there was a break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters at Watergate in Washington, but nobody thought it was a big deal. They thought, everybody thought it was a local Washington, D.C. burglary. Um, but because it was the Democratic Party headquarters, our uh, assignment editor thought someone, we should send someone. And it was such an insignificant story, uh, and the measure of it is, that they sent me, the newest person, just because we just should get a body over there. So they sent me, and I covered the story from the very beginning and one of the very early uh, so, sort of developments was the arraignment of the actual burglars and I was in the courtroom there were almost no reporters there no network television for sure but I was there and uh, the one other reporter I met uh, sat next to me and we chatted about what was going on and it was Bob Woodward of all people and he was covering it um, for the local metro page of the Washington Post because they too thought it was a local story and a local break in um, but if you had been in the courtroom that day you would have figured out that it was bigger than that because one of the burglar well more than one had had connections to the CIA and they had hundred dollar bills with consecutive numbers and phony passports and that all came out right at the beginning so Bob said to how me how long was that how long was that after you moved so he called you so you got to be down here tomorrow I moved you show in, up in April and the break-in was in June. And I oh hadn't God. really covered any major story at all. That's amazing timing, it, It's right? amazing, but even in the beginning of the story, the only, uh, the only way I could get anything I was learning out was to do radio, CBS radio. Radio was still a big part of CBS News in those days. So it was, it was still pretty good to be on CBS radio but I found out years and years later like 20 years later that most of those reports never went anywhere they never put them on the air so they didn't believe me they didn't believe it was a big story wow. despite what I was reporting so. Tim you remember Watergate I'm sure I can tell by the color of your hair that you definitely remember Watergate. <laughs> he just turned 60 this year, so we, I was giving him a hard time on it. It's a so good birthday, good. Tim. It's a You're great birthday. You're giving me birthday. good ammo. It's a great birthday. <laughs> December 16th. Mm -hmm. My birthday. That's your birthday? That's his birthday. Tim, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> that is your birthday? December 16, you, me, Beethoven, Jane Austen, the Boston Tea Party, <laughs> uh, to name several of our birthday mates. Wow, that's amazing. So you're a Sag. I was wondering, you, you must have been very confused why he just said your birthday. I was totally, I thought he was going to talk about my birthday. Wow. <laughs> you really made your own luck. Would that be the biggest lesson you learned from that story? 
or was it something else? Don't let me forget to ask you about the books behind you, but um, this is interesting. I was interviewed very early in my career um, by two women who were doing a research project at Rice University, and they were trying to determine what makes people successful. And they, I asked them if, they'd, if they had any conclusions yet by the time they were interviewing me. And they said, well, they hadn't finished, but an early conclusion was that all, all the women they had, were interviewing or had interviewed, all of them, said that they were successful because of luck. And none of the men said that. None of the, <laughs> the men all said they did it. You know, they worked hard or whatever. Um, but the women said luck. And I do think that uh, my career benefited greatly from things like good timing because of affirmative action, is, which is how I was hired, um, and Watergate, which really did launch my career because I took Bob Woodward's advice and clung to the story, which lasted for, you know, well over two years, which is unusual for uh, one political government story to last that long, uh, which allowed me to develop sources and really learn um, how to follow a story and dig and uh, become a, a reporter. Uh, so I think luck did have a lot to do with my career, but I'll confess I worked what other people thought was hard, but I loved it and it didn't feel hard. It felt like I was every day where I wanted to be every day still. It hasn't left yet. Um, I, I, and it's not that I, I look at the next rung. I don't. I love what I do. E even going back, I said, to the very beginning when I was a reporter, I really love it. The joy of what I do now at 60 Minutes is we pick our own stories. They're not assigned the way they usually are in journalism. Um, so I, I'm always you know, committed and loving the stories I'm working on. It's, it's <laughs> Wow. The reason, Tim, that I was asking about your books, and I'm moving in so I can really see, do you collect first editions? Um, and I'm interested because my husband was a collector of first editions. We have a huge library, a wonderful, incredible library um, that he bequeathed to our daughter, and she's allowing me <laughs> to hold on to them because they're so beautiful. And I, I keep <laughs> this library just the way Aaron liked it because it's wonderful. People come on tours to our li his library. Yes, they are first editions. Yeah. Did you actually, Tim, go out and collect? Did you, for example, find an author you liked and go look for the, his books or her books? Most of the books my mother bought me over the years. Some of them were a gift from my old English professor at Syracuse who gave them to me after she passed away. So you So so she's the collector. Your mother is the collector of first editions. That's great. I love it. Um is your mother alive? Yeah, she well How old my is she? dad's adopt my dad's adopted mom passed away. His biological mom, he has a relationship with her too. She's still alive. How old is she? Is she, is she? Let's see. I don't want to guess in case she listens. Dad, do you know? <laughs> well, she's my age. She has to be at least my age. She has to be eighty something. But we won't we won't press it if she's sensitive about her age. <laughs> she's a young eighty four. Yeah, that's Nancy Pelosi's age because I just interviewed her. Eighty four. I just watched her. We just watched an interview with her. She was great. I, she's great. I love her. She's wonderful. Anyway. I love the uh, – I'm I'm very uh, – I don't know. Politically, I, I, I'm like very down the middle. I, I get very frustrated by both sides, so I'm somewhere in the middle, yeah. which I think is most people, unfortunately. Be, but, being in the middle means being negative. 
That's sad. Yeah. But I know it's yeah. true. I know it's true. But you're, I love that you called out the, the Joe Biden on the Mount Rushmore. You're like, come on. <laughs> I probably I don't be. even, whether you, whether you like Joe Biden or don't like Joe Biden, Mount Rushmore, come on. <laughs> I did say that. That's great. So every now and then things pop out. <laughs> All right. We're back with you, Tim. Troy, you and I will talk about the uh, progress with the disease. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. All right. Is your, is your dad writing me another question? Can you tell the story of when you were referred to as, quote, the female, and did you take offense? Uh, I know what you're talking about. Um, so uh, I get it was 1974, and I was going to be part of a, a election night coverage I was going to sit in a in the drum with Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather and Roger Mudd, the big guys. And I was very, very nervous about it. And the head of CBS, the president of CBS News, said, nothing to worry about. It's kind of cozy up there. And I'll take you around. We'll go see what it what it's going to look like. And he was trying to calm me down. So we get there, and the carpenters are, were still building the drum. And in front of uh, Uncle Walter's seat, it said Cronkite. And in front of Dan's seat, it said Rather. And Roger's seat, it said Mud. And in front of my seat, it said Female. And... <laughs> The president of CBS News was so mortified, just mortified. And I thought it was funny. I don't know. I thought it was funny. I was not appalled. I just thought, I guess what I thought was funny was um, how embarrassed the, the president of CBS was. Richard Salant was his name. And he was embarrassed. And I thought, oh, come on. I can take a joke. I mean, I, no. My husband, Aaron, always used to say that. Um, you know you've arrived when you can make fun of yourself. So I wanted to know I had arrived so I'm making fun of myself. You were a real pioneer. Tell people what it was like back then. People who are younger than 60 will find it hard to believe what things were like not that long ago. They do. Uh, that's true. And they find it hard to believe because... There, ha there has been progress, um, not enough, obviously, but we do have a woman running, second woman running for president right now. The second, don't forget, Hillary ran. Actually, Shirley Chisholm ran, too, so we'll say the third woman. Uh, but I, I, I guess I look upon the fact that young people, women, don't know what we went through as a triumph. You know, it is a triumph to think that young women expect to have long, successful careers and they expect to be in leadership. It's wonderful. Um, what I say, though, is women's movement is over 30 years old. And what's taken so long? Why has it taken so long? I would have thought we'd have a woman president by now. Um, I would have thought more than 50% of CEOs would be women. There are more women going to graduate schools and, and succeeding in that way. Why haven't we had more women at the tops of all kinds of industries. And one of the reasons it, it appears is because of child raising. And uh, it speaks to the need for better child care in our country. Um, so it's, I don't know why that's taking so long to achieve either. You became the first woman White House correspondent. Is that right? And what was that like on Air Force One did anyone ever make the terrible mistake of disrespecting you? Yeah. <laughs> Let me answer the last one first. 
I don't know if I would use the word disrespecting, but um, I was yelled at by people in different administrations because I covered three presidents. And I'll tell you about that, the yell that part. Um, I was shocked by it because my father, for example, never yelled at me. It was the first time a man had ever yelled at me, really. And it was shocking. Um, and I, I cried. I cried. Thank goodness I was on the phone. And uh, I hung up, and my colleague Bob Pierpoint, if you remember him, he was another White House correspondent for CBS News. And he saw me, and he said, when they yell at me, I cry too. So that was a very sweet thing for him to say to me. That's nice. Um, but I was the first female White House correspondent for CBS News. The truth is that there have been women in journalism forever. You can go way back. Women are attracted to this profession. Um, and there, there just haven't been numbers but there have always been a few. Remember Eleanor Roosevelt, how uh, many of her f friends were women reporters. So we've been around forever and ever, just a few of us in each era. But uh, now, thank goodness, there are many of us. Um, so I, I didn't think of myself in those days. I covered Jimmy Carter as being, you know, the only female, because that was not true. Judy Woodruff was there at NBC, and many of the print reporters were women, and Helen Thomas was considered the dean of the White House press corps. She was at UPI. So we always had, you know, a fair percentage of the White House press corps were female, so it wasn't, it wasn't that unusual. But what I found was that, and I'm not sure this is the female necessarily, but what I found was that the Democrats under Jimmy Carter um, were tougher on women than Republicans who came in after, than the Reagan people. And I, I was always amused by that. Um, the Reagan people treated me like I was just a reporter, whereas the Carter people treated me as a female reporter. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that was. This when you say that, Leslie, what, is, what does that mean? Like, what did they, did they say things different? Or did they not answer things? Like, I what, just, was that, what does I, that mean? I was conscious that they were, uh, yeah, treating me as a girl. And I didn't really feel that until the Reagan people came in and didn't treat me that way. Then I knew that there was a difference and a distinction. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure why that was, because Jimmy Carter was the one pushing for the Equal Rights Amendment, and Ronald Reagan was against it. And that was a measure of, of at least attitudes on policy. And But the way we were treated was, uh, you know, it, things were turned around. Let's talk about a particularly good man. How did you meet your late husband, Aaron, and what about him impressed you? Well, he was beyond handsome. I remember the first time I laid eyes on him and I thought, oh, my God. You know, he was a Texan and he wore cowboy boots always. And he looked like a cowboy. He did. He looked that way. And, uh, he, he came, he, he was, he, we, we met because he wanted to interview me. And he wanted to interview me about Watergate. Because he was assigned a, a, a column for New York Magazine. And he came to Washington and everything he was learning, um, about the Senate hearings were already on television. So he was getting desperate, and someone said, Leslie Stahl's been covering it from the beginning. You should talk to her. So he was interviewing me, and he picked me up at work, and I was recording a radio story in a radio booth 
that had a glass window. And he could see in and I could see out. And they sent him back there to get pick me up. And I saw him and he walked into the room, the, the room that was adjacent to the studio. And I thought, oh, my. Now, that's one good looking dude. That's one. <laughs> One handsome man. So that was number one. Then he turned out to be brilliant. And uh, he was a writer, like you, Tim. And uh, he became part of the Watergate press corps. And that was almost like an animal. Not animalistic in the beast way of that word, but one big organism. And we spent two and a half years together this group of reporters in Washington. He became part of that. So we became very good friends. Um, In fact, we became best friends. It's that old story, you know. You end up marrying your best friend. And that's what happened. We We were together from, I would say, halfway through Watergate. And then Nixon resigned. And we looked at each other and said, uh-oh, what are we going to talk about now? <laughs> we have nothing to talk about. We did nothing but that story. Nothing. That was it. It was morning, noon, and night. It was the only conversation in Washington, all of Washington, for those years. And so you know what we did to save the relationship? We went on a diet together. And that's how we survived. We went on the cabbage diet. I don't know if you've ever cooked cabbage, but it's putrid. It just smells awful. And my apartment, oh, my God, where we were living at Watergate, um, you couldn't walk in. So for about two weeks, that's all we (laughs) ate was cabbage soup. Oh, but we lost a lot of weight. And then, of course, you know, diets, we gained it all back. But it, it was the bridge that got us from Watergate to kind of finding out about each other. Well, what do you like to do? I don't, I don't know. What do you like to do? That kind of thing. I know he must have really loved you to pretend to like cabbage soup for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I would have said I must have loved him yeah. <laughs> to make it for him two weeks. I heard you say once that you didn't get to see your daughter much and you missed a lot of important moments. Does she have a career? And did you ever advise her on balancing work and family? Of career. Um, Well, let me, I want to take one step back uh, because Troy told me, Tim, that you coached his teams and Aaron coached Taylor's teams, my daughter. Um, he coached basketball and uh, his father was a football coach in Texas. So that just gives you an idea, high school football, <laughs> of how important his father was wherever they lived. Um, and so Aaron wanted to be a coach, uh, but chose basketball. Uh, he and Taylor were extremely close. He was a wonderful, hands on father. He read every single book that she was ever assigned in her entire education from first grade through her last year in college. Every single book, including math (laughs) and all her biology books, every single book so that he could talk to her about what she was reading and studying. His mother was a school teacher. Both his parents were school teachers, football coach and a teacher, father. And his mother said to him, it doesn't matter who teaches your child as long as she's learning. So he decided that he was going to become a teacher as well as a father and a football coach. So he used to discuss all her books with her. Um, This allowed me to go fulfill my career, meaning... As a White House correspondent, I traveled with the president. Um, My life had to conform to the president's schedule as much as my home life schedule. Um, The wonderful thing about my daughter 
is that she doesn't resent it at all. I used to tell her it's a wonderful thing that I have this career because if I were home and put all my energy into you, you'd be crazy. You'd be a crazy girl, and you're not. (laughs) Uh, uh, She does have a career. It is not mine. It's her father's because uh, he became a screenwriter, and she wanted to work in Hollywood, uh, not as a writer, but as a producer, but based on the fact that she came out to Hollywood when he became a writer uh, and decided that's what she wanted to do. She decided that very young in her life and fulfilled it. When she went to college um, on the theory that you don't uh, have to study what your career is going to be, she majored in geology. Go explain that. Uh, (laughs) But then she went back to what she said as a child she wanted to do and She's out. I'm in Los Angeles right now, and she's out here, and she's a, pr- a producer, television producer. And you guys got your. It sounds like your bond got really special too. Now, like later in life too. With We've always Patrick been Parkinson. close. We've yeah. always had a great relationship, but um, became much closer when Aaron got sick. And now she treats me like she's my mother. I don't know. <laughs> she does. You should have seen her when I was rock climbing this morning, and she was putting the harness on me. I don't know. Have you ever gone rock climbing? Not in a long time, but you I've know? seen it. You've I've seen, seen it. it. So I know the. It's very intense. Are, are are both of you watching the Olympics? I'm watching when I can. I know my dad. Yeah. yeah. I would say yeah. I went over to my my dad's house last night. We're neighbors. So I walked over. And he was, yeah, they had the Olympics on. Yeah. Well, there's rock climbing. It's an Olympic event now. So. I saw, did you see that woman in like six seconds, 6.0? She like broke the world record. She no. broke her own record, which was the world record. Oh, my God. That was something unbelievable. It looks yeah. like a spider, right? They climb. I saw yeah. it in the gym this morning. A guy was doing that speed. Crazy. Yeah, crazy. Wonderful. You've said that Margaret Thatcher was the toughest interview you've ever done. You've interviewed some of the world's most influential people, so I'm curious, what made her stand out above the rest? Okay. Um, the Margaret Thatcher interview I did on Face the Nation, um, and it was not only that she was tough. She may have been the smartest person I ever interviewed, um, and the, not smart only because she had a lot of information in her head, but because she could maneuver around tough questions like nobody you'd ever, I'd ever met. And I think still have ever met, but I, she came over at the height of a scandal, the Iran Contra scandal, which caught Ronald Reagan in a lie and his actual ratings plummeted. People think he was popular for his entire presidency, which wasn't true. He suffered greatly from this scandal, and uh, where the United, where his administration uh, gave arms not only to Iran, which was which had held our Americans hostage, but also to the Contras in Latin America who were terrorists. So it was a huge scandal. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were very close, and she came to the United States to support him. She came on Face the Nation, and I said to her, but he lied to you. He told you he hadn't done those things, and he had. Doesn't that hurt your friendship? Oh, no, she said. Our friendship is rock solid. Well, what about your country and our country? I mean, we lied to you. It wasn't just person to person. It was country to country. How can you ever trust us? Our relationship, she said again, is as solid as it could be. And stupid me, I asked essentially the same question a third time. And she snapped. She snapped. (laughs) And she said the following, which is the worst thing that's ever been said to me on live television. She said to me, my dear, why does it seem to me 
that I love your country more than you do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It was a puddle of protoplasm, every fluid in my body, blood, everything was just on the floor. I didn't know where to go, what to do. And I said, well, thank you, Prime Minister, for appearing on Face the Nation. Go to, go to commercial. Um, yeah. it, was, it was painful. She was just wily as can be. Uh, up until that point, the interview was excellent. She was smart, and uh, she was kind of a teacher. You know, some people, you ask questions, and their only purpose is to duck you know, get you off the subject, not answer the questions that you've put there, answer some other question because they've been taught to stick to the script or whatever. But she answered the questions and um, I appreciated that. I then sent her a letter and I told her that the mail I was getting was running a thousand to one. Every one letter I got on my side she got a thousand, and uh, that was true. And my one came from my mother. You know, it was it wasn't even big. And she wrote back and said something like, "Cheer up, you know, cheer up. These things pass." And I framed the letter. I have it in my office, of course. Favorite letter, favorite interview, favorite letter. That's great. Yeah. You have won numerous awards for your work, including 13 Emmys, and one of those was for Lifetime Achievement. What is the most meaningful award that you've won and why? Wow. Ah, I have to think about that. That's too hard. That's like asking me my favorite story. And I can't because I told you already I love all my stories. I do. I really each one's a little baby, and I, I'm just trying to think of a story that I won that would be, you know, more important than any of the others. I can't. Too hard. See, so you're asking. I'm ducking. Pick a, pick a couple. How about, how about pick a couple that are uh, some of your favorites? I am. Uh, I'm, I'm ducking your question. Like I just said, Margaret <laughs> Thatcher didn't do. Um, you know, one of the first stories I did was a human interest story and I came to 60 Minutes from Washington where I'd been for 20 years and only covered politics and government and the budget and arms control and presidential politics, all of that. I loved it, but it was uh, not heartwarming, let's say. So I come to 60 Minutes. Oh, and by the way, in Washington, you weren't supposed to express an opinion even in your face, meaning no smiling or no frowning or, you know, no blinking. Just straight, straight to camera, unemotional, just tell the story the way it is and leave the scene. So I get to 60 and I think it was my third story it was about a surgeon, a brain surgeon uh, at Mayo Clinic. And he, people only went to him if they were told by their regular doctor that their aneurysm or whatever was inoperable. Cancer, brain cancer, it was inoperable. They sent them to Dr. Sunt. And Dr. Sunt had bone cancer, which was excruciatingly painful. And in fact, to operate, he wore a a whalebone corset because even his scrubs uh, rubbing up against his rib cage hurt. But the real story was that he was in constant pain except when he operated. And when he operated, he had no pain. So the brain, you know, I don't know. They, it, it does, it controls pain, it controls things. And he was engaging his brain so intensely on something that required his utmost attention, no pain. So I get the, I bring all my footage back, the interviews, we followed him around for a couple of days. They let us 
into the uh, operating room. We fought, we shot that. We shot him with a little boy who had cancer. His head was shaved, the little boy. And Dr. Hunt's head was shaved. And he got down on his hands and knees. He was the same height as this little boy. And he said, look, we're both bald. Isn't it great? I mean, he was just so empathetic and wonderful. Bring, bring the story back, and I go to my boss. I said, it's a great story, great man, but you'll never run it. And he said, why? I said, because I love this man, and it shows, and you will not be able to get that off my face. Just, it's obvious. And so you won't run it. And he laughed at me, and he said, you know, there are stories at 60 Minutes where you're allowed to like. And you know something? I was born again. I was going to be able to do something that I'd suppressed for 20 years. And that is express. I mean, obviously, if I did those uh, stories on politics or arms control, I would have to revert. But there were certain kinds of stories that I could express liking and approving and disapproving and things like that. So that was one of my early favorites for sure for that reason. Leslie, I could talk to you all week and I'd still not exhaust the fascinating places you've been to and the people you have spoken to, but I want to be respectful of your time. So are you ready for some tough questions? Oh, I like to ask tough <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ready for them myself. Uh-oh, what's coming? I'm nervous too. I don't know. <laughs> In 2021, you did a story on trans children's health care. I watched it. And you opened and closed the story with the opinions of a gender psychologist who was herself transgender, followed by the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, who was supportive of gender transition. And finally, you qualified the story by saying that most people who transition are satisfied. And then you revealed four young people who were not happy in transition. One girl who had a double mastectomy and a boy who was castrated. And you were highly criticized by several LGBTQ groups for including these transitioned young people in your story. After receiving that criticism, do you regret doing that story? No, I don't regret doing that story. Um, in fact, the original idea was to do a story just about them. Um, and then I decided that was unfair because they didn't represent um, the, it, it, they, they actually are a small percentage. But I thought it was important that their voices be heard because um, it is part of it. So I don't regret it at all. And, you know, Tim, I've been criticized a lot. And I learned very early. In fact, I learned it the day that White House man yelled at me um, that taking that criticism is part of it. It's part of the job. And... Um, the important thing is not to put up a wall and say, okay, I'm going to be criticized. I'm not going to listen, you know, because it, they're going to, someone's going to criticize every story you do. But you still have to listen because you, you have to accept that sometimes you get it wrong. Um, I didn't get it wrong in that story. We did say they're not the majority, but... I very much wanted to get that information out there, that there are some people who uh, are having operations when they're very young, and there are some people who are regretting, deeply regretting, that they've done that. So, In October of 2020, you interviewed then-President Donald Trump, and he famously or infamously walked out of the interview. Now, looking back at it, do you think you might have given him a hard time when you mocked him saying, suburban women, please like me, please, please? Do you think you may have intentionally goaded him into walking off? I don't think I goaded him into walking off. I think that 
when you're a politician, your job includes uh, uh, being accountable to the public. And in our system, unlike the parliamentary system, you are accountable through the press, through taking questions, tough or not tough, and answering, and not ducking, and not walking out, um, but answering, and answering respectfully, seriously. And when I say respectfully, I don't mean respecting the reporter. I mean respecting the public's right to hear your answer. Um, because they've elected these people and the public deserves uh, to hear what they have to say on, on issues of importance. And it was a very serious interview that I had uh, planned. As I said, and, and they ran in the piece, I, there were a lot of questions that I planned to ask that I didn't get to ask. Um, but I don't regret asking serious, tough questions, and politicians shouldn't walk out. And wasn't he kind of right about COVID? Wasn't opening up the country the right thing to do in hindsight? If you had that to do over again, would you do it differently? Would I do it differently? Um, You know something, Tim? On that question, um, I'm going to duck. Because I don't think it's my role um, to approve or disapprove of actions taken by the president, especially when you know that we we could be I, I could be any one of us could be interviewing them again. So I don't like to give opinions if I don't have to. So I'll, I'm going to duck on that one. <laughs> I feel like a politician myself right now, ducking a question. And I don't like to duck you especially, but I'm going to. What style of piece do you enjoy more? Segments with verbal sparring or more of the human interest types of stories? Um, I like them both. I like them both a lot. And I like that I get to do both. Um, I love that I can do medical stories. I would love to do a story on ALS um, and the progress that's been made. Um, I love doing stories, happy stories. Um, I've done stories on prodigy, musical prodigies. I love those. Um, I love asking politicians tough questions. Uh, I, I told you, I really haven't lost my enthusiasm or appreciation for the fact that I am still allowed to do this job. And I say allowed because I told you my age, so I feel I'm deeply privileged because I still love it. Um, I don't know how long, how much longer I'll be doing it, but as long as I can, I hope that they let me. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid-fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? I hate not to give you a direct answer, but it would have to be um, three. When my daughter was born, when my older grandchild, Jordan, was born, and when my younger grandchild, Chloe, was born. What is the biggest adversity you faced? My husband uh, had a long, difficult uh, illness with Parkinson's disease um, and it was hard. What are you most excited about? I'm excited about seeing the story of my granddaughters. Um, I, I'm going to live forever so I'm going to find out what careers they choose because I hope they'll be like me and my daughter. Um, what kind of men they choose or women, um, and hope that they get married because it's important not to be alone. Um, And so that's what I'm excited about, seeing how it all turns out. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? 
Uh, yes. Uh, I want to come meet you, Tim, in person, because I don't have very good eyesight, so I'm having trouble <laughs> really seeing you <laughs> and your environs. And I would like very much to report on the progress that's been made um, on ALS. And I think that if you've been on 60 Minutes twice, that you need a third shot. <laughs> Third time's the charm. Yeah, a hat trick. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, thanks so much for doing this. Then one more question I want to ask you before we wrap up okay. is at the end of every podcast episode, um, one of the things that was important to, to my dad and I when we were starting the podcast was we didn't want to get boxed in with him being you know, the NFL. We didn't want to be just sports. With ALS, his ALS, we didn't want to be just uh, you know uh, medical. And uh, with his writing, we never just authors. So it's very important to us that – we talk to just tons of different people, all different backgrounds, all different stories. And so at the end of every episode, we ask people, who are a couple of people that you know personally that you think we should have on the show? Oh, um, you have to have Mahomes. And uh, you have to have, I mean, I, I hope you have a lot of sports people on your show. I hope you do. Oh, yeah. Um, I think... I'm thinking of people I would like to interview myself. Um, <laughs> I love medical stories. I love medical stories. Um, but m maybe a medical story that's not related to your disease. Maybe, I mean, you did talk about cancer, cancer research, uh, or something not life-threatening, you know? Like face, sure. facelifts or something silly, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. A musician. Be nice to do, uh, interview someone who's, um, who makes other people happy. I'm sure you've done all of these. How many, how many it's people funny. have, how many podcasts have you done so far? Um, we've done, we're close, we're close to about the 25, 26. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Well, I would, yeah. I would, we make do a, one every week. So I would make a list of all the different professions and then, you know, decide who in those professions you want to hear. You know, I might want to hear from, um, Malcolm Gladwell, um, because I, I love the 10,000 hours. Of, of work you have to put in to really know what you're doing, you know, before you actually get there. Um, so, yeah. Now, those are, those are two. Mahomes and Gladwell are two great ones. And that's Esther's, uh, you know, you were one of the people Esther said, too. So that was the perfect uh, really? oh, my friend, <laughs> questions working for us. Maybe when I come up to talk to you, I'll bring Esther with me. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Well, I uh, am I am I done? Am I done? I know my dad's gonna. Because I would like to thank you. I enjoyed it, and I, uh, you know, the truth is, people like to talk about themselves. You know, even if we're shy, which I'm not, but um, we like to talk about. It, so it's fun. <laughs> Leslie Stahl, thank you so much for your time today. You are truly incredible and an inspiration to us all. May God continue to bless you and your family. Tim, I enjoyed it. I love meeting you and talking to you. And um, the same with Troy. You've done good with your kids, by the way. Like you already know that. You know that. Um, all right. Well, I'll be in touch. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team, of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. 
If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.